the adored New York City. He idolized it all out of proportion. Uh, no, make that, he, he romanticized it all out of proportion. Yeah. To him, no matter what the season was, this was still a town that existed in black and white and pulsated to the great tunes of George Gershwin. Uh, now, let me start this off. Chapter one. He was too romantic about Manhattan, as he was about everything else. He thrived on the hustle bustle of the crowds and the traffic. To him, New York meant beautiful women and street smart guys who seemed to know all the angles. Ah, no, corny, too corny for you know, my taste. <clears throat> let, me, let me try and make it more profound. Chapter one. He adored New York City. To him, it was a metaphor for the decay of contemporary culture. The same lack of individual integrity that caused so many people to take the easy way out was rapidly turning the town of his dreams and... No, it's gonna be too preachy. I mean, you know, let's face it, I wanna sell some books here. Chapter one. He adored New York City, although to him it was a metaphor for the decay of contemporary culture. How hard it was to exist in a society desensitized by drugs, loud music, television, crime, garbage. Too angry. I don't want to be angry. Chapter one. He was as tough and romantic as the city he loved. Behind his black-rimmed glasses was the coiled sexual power of a jungle cat. Oh, I love this. New York was his town, and it always would be. You're a joke maker. It's hard not to make jokes. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm always amazed when I see somebody that can draw a horse. I can't figure out how they can possibly do it. Because, you know, they actually reproduce the horse with a pencil and paper, and it's terrific. Now, I can't draw a horse or anything else, but um, I can write jokes. And uh, it's hard not to write them. I mean, if I walk down the street, it's almost my, it's like my normal conversation. You know, it just comes out that way. Do, do you know what I mean? This is my uh, collection. This is how I'll, I'll start, and it, there's all kinds of scraps and, and things that are written on hotel things. And I'll, you know, ponder these things. And I pull these out, and, I, and I'll dump them here like this. I go through this all the time. Uh, and, and every time I start a project, and I, and I sit here like this, and I look at them, don't like that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Read me one note off of one piece of paper. A, a note here would be a, a, a man inherits the, uh, all the magic tricks of a great magician. Now, that's all I have there. But I could see, you know, a story forming where some little jerk like myself uh, at an auction or at some opportunity buys all those illusions and, you know, boxes and, and uh, guillotines and things, and it leading me to some kind of interesting adventure, going into one of those boxes and maybe suddenly showing up in a different time frame or at a different country or or at a different place altogether, or, you know, or some kind of thing. And, you know, I'll spend an hour thinking of that, and it'll go no place, and I'll go on to the next one. Just from when I started as a nightclub comic, uh, Jack Rollins, who was the, the great manager of all these acts, said to me, just work every night, and don't think about it, and just work, and just by working, you will develop without thinking of it, just the kind, and that's what happens uh, with with film too. By just constantly working at it, you do develop a little more, uh, not a lot, <laughs> but a little more authority and a little more confidence or or skill, and you're able to tell a story more succinctly or more movingly, or um, and yet because it's not an exact science you fail a certain amount of times. Uh, you know, whether you're Fellini or Bergman or whoever, you, you know, it, 
you still are going to fail a certain amount of times because no matter how much you practice and get some skill, you can't, you can't uh, make it work all the time. What were you trying to say in this picture? I was just trying to be funny. <laughs> Do you find it very hard to direct yourself? Uh, hard? No, no, I just have to resist the temptation to give myself too many extreme close-ups. <laughs> you studied filmmaking in school? No, 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 I, I didn't study anything in school. They studied me. <laughs> I understand you studied philosophy at school. Uh, no, that's not true. I, I, I did take, I took one course in existential philosophy at, uh, at New York University, and uh, <coughs> on, uh, on the final, they gave me ten questions, and uh, I couldn't answer a single one of them, you know? I left them all blank. I got a hundred. <laughs> Your films are always psychological, never political. Where do you stand politically? What can I say to that? I'm, I'm for uh, total, honest democracy, you know, and I also believe the American system can work. <laughs> A lot of people have accused you of being narcissistic. No, I know people think that I'm egotistical and narcissistic, but it's not true. I, I, uh, I, as a matter of fact, if I did identify with a Greek mythological character, it would not be Narcissus. Who would it be? Zeus. <laughs> Who is this guy, anyhow, to rewrite the end of my movie? And, and since when are, are all these guys involved? What the hell's going on? These are on? the new heads of the studio. What do you mean? That every six months I meet a new group of studio heads. It's very disconcerting to me, too. But you know, the mortality rate in this business is unbelievable. Yeah, I'll say it. It's like the Black Plague. Jesus. I and, you're wonderful. Uh, Can I have your autograph? Yeah, I don't want anybody me going too, to, to jazz heaven. That's a, that's a, a nitwit idea. Uh, you know, the, the whole point of the movie is that nobody is saved. Sandy, this is an Easter film. We don't need a movie by an atheist. To, you, more, to you, I'm an atheist. To God, I'm the loyal opposition. Hey, Sandy, Jerry Abraham, remember me? We grew up together. Of course I remember. Yes, Miss, the other day. Of course I remember you. Why should I forget you? Well, you know, people grow up, they become big hot shots, they forget. We played stickball together, right? Yeah, we oh. went to Hebrew school, too. Yeah, so what are you doing? What are you up to? You know what I do now? I drive a cab. You... Well, you look good. Just, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Yeah, but look at me compared to you. Oh, I mean, Jesus. all the beautiful broads. I mean, I you know, I mean, you know, know that's great. Drunk. What do you want me to say? I, w I was a kid in the neighborhood that told the jokes, right? Yeah. So, so we, you know, we live in a, in a society that puts a big value on jokes. You know, if you think of it this way, <clears throat> if I had been an Apache Indian, those guys didn't need comedians at all, right? So, so I'd be out of work. Oh, come on, Hand. That doesn't help me <laughs> feel better, you know? <laughs> I don't know what to say. I got such a headache. You know, it's luck. It's all luck. I was lucky. I'm the first to admit I was a lucky bum. If I, if, I, if I was not born in Brooklyn, if I hadn't born in Poland or, or Berlin, I'd be a lampshade today, right? Right. I mean, it was just, could happen just like that. So, you know, be thankful that you're not Nat Bernstein. That that yeah, yeah, wasted yeah, away. Right? Incurable disease. It was absolutely terrible. Oh, wow. Germany loves you. Oh. Oh, like, oh Gemma? Germany. Oh, Germany. Oh, Germany. Germany. The, entire, Germany the entire country. Um, Great. A lot of people. Yeah. A lot of 